And yet there's a sense in which, in the historical record at least, religions have been the channel through which the most profound disorientations of the human mind and heart have been healed. And yet we do not deal with just an inner reality here. We deal with the context that if you in any way disturb the order of creation, it's not something external to us that has been manipulated, but in a sense defines who we are and our own capacities to respond at their root. In watching the movie, I couldn't help but remember the many voices I've heard through the years in conferences, one of which was at a conference in Tehran. And there was a French uh, hydrologist there, an expert in uh, urban renewal. And he said something which resonates with me practically in every conference I go to. He said regarding water, and therefore also regarding the people of Tuvalu and others who are receiving the impact uh, and are most vulnerable to climate change, he said, if you take a people's future away, you rob them of all hope. And I think it's the purpose, really, of religious thought to indicate where hope lies, and in a sense, where our destiny and faith calls us, not only to be implicated, but to be proactive and helpful. And so these are difficult times. Deference is not met by Difference is not met by deference. Economic efficiency often disparages social <coughs> equity. The artifice of a monoculture contradicts our credence to the core. The most fundamental contradiction resides in the alienation of the human community from the earth community. As I look at the presentations by delegations here, one of the most outstanding, remarkable, difficulties for me to understand is how the disparagement of the moral and the ethical and the spiritual uh, becomes evident in the very articulations within the Kyoto uh, Protocol and within this process of the convention that would open us up to a sense of cooperation and help. I was at a conference uh, yesterday, a side event yesterday, where the whole idea of equity was reduced to national aspiration. And in a real sense, it was almost the developing countries and the developed countries pointing at one another saying, you have a hole in your part of this life raft. And so we have to look at such things as equity in terms of a more profound sense of transcendence and, and meaning. And to do this, we'll make a few <coughs> distinctions if we might. The ethical has to do with reason. The moral and the moral mind is driven by fulfillment. And the sacred offers a sense of transcendence. None of these are mutually opposed to one another, but if we look at our participation here, it seems to me that the whole ethical sense it is remarkably important because it indicates the capacity of the human to know what is true and to do what is right. And so if we put that and parallel it with the principle of uh, the principle of, uh, what is it called? Um, sorry. The precautionary principle. We are, in a sense, uh, made mindful of that. If we take the, the principle of sustainability, it is more in terms of fulfillment. 
But if we look at equity, equity can give us a sense of, I think, of transcendence. A sense of opening up to a wider context of things. And can help people such as ourselves be present in a very remarkable way to inform and to be part of the resolution of climate change. And so, in an in in attempt to do that, I have prepared this, if you will, uh, PowerPoint. And then I'll come back, hopefully, to the new measure that religion must take, the new ambience it must enter into, and the new paradigm it must become if it is to be truly effective. Let me first give you an image. The reason why we are all at home, at the water's edge, or enthralled by the immensity of the sea, or while a child is delighted in chasing the flight of a butterfly, the reason is because the universe story and the earth story and the human story are two sides of the same narrative. They constitute one narrative. The child finds fulfillment in everything that surrounds her, for these are moments of self-discovery. Now, everyone can identify with that. It is universal. However, without ethical insight to guide our way forward, our consideration of equity, or if you will, inequities, may well reduce ideas to ideologies and concepts to conflict. <coughs> equity is framed by a number of issues of concrete inequity, vulnerability, adaptation, development, all of which evidenced in these discourses at the UNFCC that relative truths always work for the advantage of the few over the many. Universal <coughs> truths present lucid and compelling insights and do so to a wider audience. Hence, there is space in, in, in at the ethical perspective that links rights and ecology under the rubrics of equity rightly considered. In the first instance, equity deals with rights, rights deferred. Now you don't hear that very much in these corridors. What you hear in these corridors is usually, you have to move or I won't move. You move first and then I will move. Or the equity is in somehow or another, if you give in something, you lose. As a matter of fact, equity is a first principle. Finds a primary disposition in reasonableness and in moderation in the exercise of one's legitimate rights. In a disposition to avoid insisting too vigorously what you truly have as a legitimate right, but you demur because something more fundamental, something much more, if you will, basic, has a prior a priority. It is, in a sense, an appeal to conscience, but it is found in law. Our world has to hear that equity calls us to a more ultimate term of reference, in the light of which legitimate rights are modified, if not forsaken, deferred, so that more fundamental rights are preserved. Rights come with, its, with existence. That which confers existence confers rights. Each entity has three rights, if you will. The right to be or the right to existence, the right to habitat, or a place to exist, and a right to fulfill its role in the ever-renewing and integrating functioning processes of the earth. 
And we all know we are here because those very processes that support and enhance life are being affected negatively. And we are called back to live life, if you will, on the basis in which life has been granted to us. The paradigm has changed. Ecology does not function within economics. Economics must function within ecology. It might be said, as it is said in some of the philosophies in Catholic theological thought, the universe is primary, the human is derivative. The most noble, noble quality in every entity in the universe is the order of the universe. rightly considered, addresses the fundamental alienation of the human community from the earth community that has occurred only in this most recent epoch of human development, the past 200 years. The great difficulty of our times is our inability to waken out of this cultural pathology. Thousands of articles have been written and a long list of books could be compiled concerned with this commitment to progress and its sense of unlimited growth. <clears throat> Yet this philosophy controls over the human venture remains vigorous. Equity supports essential growth. In a special manner, humans have not only a need, but a right of access to the natural world to provide not only the physical need of humans, but also the wonder needed by human intelligence, the beauty needed by human imagination, and the intimacy needed by human emotions for personal fulfillment and therefore for the fulfillment of the planet itself. Unless and until humanity achieves an ethical stance that recognizes the intrinsic value of nature all of our efforts will end in failure. There is a sense in all of this that we hear in this corridor that environmental integrity, economic efficiency, and social equity are equal. They are not equal. There was a wonderful presentation by Will Steffitt, I believe his name is director of the climate change studies at the National University of Australia, stated clearly that he has a different paradigm. Concentric circles in which the environment is the larger circle, social equity, and economic efficiency within that. And therefore, as a final remark, how do I see religions as such, if they are to be effective, how should they look upon themselves? And how should they realize that they are part of this changing paradigm? And if I can find this quote, I'll finish the presentation. <laughs> it's very good and it's worth waiting for. <laughs> yes, I think I, I found it. As part of this long cosmic process, it can be said that the varied spiritual traditions scattered across the globe are not of yesterday nor are they simply of the earth. In some manner, they were born when the galaxies appeared in the limitless swirl of space, 
The dynamic at work in all this has found unique expression in the formation of the green earth, with its myriad forms of life and their completion in man. In man, the galaxies become aware of themselves. The globe comes to its most intense form of life. Matter reaches its high transformation in those interior spiritual experiences within the human comes to itself in both its personal identity and identity with the universe. This process takes place in the presence of that divine mystery in which everything finds its peace and its perfection. Thank you very much.